Do you expect me to talk? Of course not, Bond Diary. I expect you to like and subscribe and enjoy this video before I turn you into double O pate. <laughs> Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And it's movies and watches and watches in movies, my favorite subject. Bond and his watches are so intrinsically linked. But what about the classic Bond villains? Well, today we take a look at my top five examples and a further four honorable mentions. So basically nine, so to speak. We analyze their choices, the reasons behind them, hidden meanings, the significance of the movie, and of course, horologically, as well as the Bond universe. So I'm going to start off with a wristwatch check, and this is inspired by Hugo Drax, one of my favourite Bond villains who doesn't seem to wear a watch, but if he did wear a watch, I'd like to think he'd wear my Fortis Cosmonaut uh, chronograph there, because of course the space connection, but I doubt he'd wear it on the Wrist Candy Watch Club rubber strap. I think it's a little bit too sporty for him. But anyway, before we get into the villains and their watches, we have to clarify and understand fundamentally what is a Bond villain uh, to help contextualize and understand their choices of watches further. So let's take a look at that first. James Bond creator Ian Fleming wanted his heroes to be, and I quote, an anonymous blunt instrument with the simplest, dullest, plainest sounding name I could find. A book about bird spotting in the Caribbean happened to be lying around at the time, and the writer took the author's name straight off the cover. However, Bond's enemies would be a different matter entirely. They had exotic names, often with distinct physical characteristics and eclectic backgrounds. When adapted from page to screen, they became even more exaggerated, eventually coining the term Bond villain and becoming a cinematic trope imitated and satirized to this day endlessly. If you missed my recent video on the pinky ring, I highly recommend it to further understand some of the stylistic decisions and cultural references behind many classic Bond villains. Just as important as the styling of our protagonist foil was the accompanying must-have accessories that have become just as much parodied and endlessly influencing others. We have, of course, the epic villain layers, easy to escape death traps for our hero to often conveniently give the villain the complete chiacchierone, an opportune moment to allow for exposition about whatever dastardly plot he's trying to undertake which often is borderline insane and sometimes just comically ridiculous. Another cinematic trope, of course. So naturally, an interesting watch that is less predictable than Bond's would matter, especially here when symbolism and opulence is preferred. Come to think of it, I have a foreign uh, sounding name that uh, English speaking people find difficult to pronounce. I have a very uh, eclectic background, shall we say. Yeah, maybe I should have been a Bond villain. I, I missed my calling in life. But what would my plot have been? Um, I don't know. St stealing all the world's watches. I, that would have been my, my scheme. Now, the entire world is about to be caught in the crossfire. See you in hell, James. You first. We kick off with number five, the character Alec Trevelyan in the first Pierce Brosnan outing as Bond in 1995's GoldenEye. Trevelyan is one of the more interesting and less cliched villains, well, except for his facial scar, which we'll talk about later on, played excellently by Sean Bean, who incidentally has played his fair share of movie and TV villains over his impressive career. Trevelyan is kind of understated compared to the more over-the-top characters he shares the screen with. But nonetheless, it works as he is a double O agent gone bad for the sake of revenge. He's smart, charming, menacing when needing to be, and could easily play Bond himself. So absolutely perfect for the role. 
Sean Bean has also played heroes many times too. Anyone remember the British TV period drama Sharp during the 90s? It's this duality that makes him entirely believable, although his greatest role, in my opinion, is the deeply disturbing bad guy in the amazing and highly overlooked first part of the Red Riding trilogy. James? For England. For England, Alec. So back to watches, and what does our uh, Bond gone bad where? Well, it's the same as the goody-goody Bond, the Amiga Seamaster. Despite being obvious product placement, I have discussed at great length how Amiga's deep and profound history of involvement with the British Armed Forces spanned over a century. So have a look back at my last Amiga review. So just like Sean Bean, Amiga is perfectly cast and entirely plausible. The fact that they wear the same watch also kind of implies that maybe, at the time, the new 90s rejuvenated Seamaster was indeed officially issued to 00 agents within the Bond universe. Although another interesting possibility was that Trevelyan was going that extra mile and garnishing his disguise as a good guy by imitating 007. So what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Or maybe it was both. I'd love to hear what you think. Either way, it works really, really well. At number four, it's the overarching supervillain. I mean, the absolute, I mean, this is the, the, the villain that coined that phrase. We are, of course, talking about Ernst Stavro Blofeld, who's, uh, according to Wikipedia, been played by no less than seven different actors and four different voice actors. James Bond, allow me to introduce myself. I am Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Most notably, there was the scar-faced Donald Pleasance, complete with a fluffy white Persian cat and an utterly manic look in his eyes. Uh, he does so well. Then there was the unforgettable comic campiness of Charles Gray, and more recently, the slightly disappointing Christoph Waltz. Don't get me wrong, I rate him very highly as an actor, but compared to his breakout role as Stendartenführer Hans Lander in Inglorious Bastards, no portrayal of spine-chilling villainy will ever compare to his work with that character. You are sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Yes. You're sheltering them underneath your floorboards, aren't you? Yes. Point out to me the areas where they're hiding. Then in the midst of it all, there's Telly Savalas in On Her Majesty's Secret Service from 1969. Complete with his Mussolini-esque silhouette, it's the only time we get to see such an important reoccurring antagonist wearing a watch that is possibly identifiable. Previously, his power jewelry of choice was the iconic spectre ring with the octopus motif engraving, the meaning of which I've recently discussed in the video I mentioned earlier. There was a very brief shot of something gold on a bunt strap worn by Charles Gray, but it wasn't until a clear shot of an oval, almost rectangle-shaped yellow gold watch on a basket weave or mesh style bracelet on the wrist of Savalis that now we can properly have a more informed guess. The distinctive look, in my opinion, belongs to the Patek Philippe Eclipse that was first released a year earlier in 1968 and quickly became the hot must-have Patek of the time. While we only see it at an angle, its thickness, bracelet style, case shape, and the timing all indicate Patek. But again, I could be wrong. Tell me what you guys think. But regardless, it fits the character well. Its design was inspired by the principle of the golden section, discovered by the ancient Greek mathematicians. This divine proportion forms the basis of some of history's greatest works of art and architecture. And of course, Savalas being Greek, it kind of fits again. Was it his own watch? We can only speculate. So despite Patek's long, illustrious and prestigious uh, horological history, I personally still associate that brand more with uh, kind of the new money, which Blofeld is, uh, well, according to the information presented in the novels. And so I think it fits his character better compared to the more old world, old money, uh, traditionalism of your JLCs, your Cartiers, your Breguets, your VCs, 
etc. Now, I have never been a fan of this particular Bond film, despite the recent trend with so many Bond fans giving it another look and hailing it as some kind of misunderstood classic. Sure, there are a lot of beautiful looking shots in the movie, but personally, I just never got the whole Lazenby as Bond thing. This never happened to the other fella. But I had to include it in the list as Blofeld, no matter which depiction, has become so influential as a villain. The characteristics, despite whichever portrayal, have become supervillain tropes in popular fiction and media far beyond Bond. Everything from Inspector Gadget to Austin Powers and even Monty Python. No, if it's the last thing I ever do, I'll get you for this gadget! Next we have Francisco Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun from 1974 at number three. Played so memorably by my fellow British Italian, the legendary Christopher Lee. This is the second movie for Roger Moore during his Rolex Submariner era, where we see Bond sent to retrieve something called the Solex Agitator. Solex, interesting. I wonder if there's any relation there. Obviously, Sole, Solex, Sol. Um, yeah, but why X at the end? Sounds like one of those dodgy um, homage brands you get from <laughs> <laughs> from Amazon. It's a breakthrough technological solution to the contemporary energy shortages. And actually, this makes a really good point. The villainous plots often reflected the anxieties of the respected time they were made. This is the part I really like. Now that's what I call solar power. That's what I call trouble. So this movie was shot during the end of the oil crisis in 1973. Other more obvious examples would be the threat of a Cold War nuclear holocaust, which was pretty much every other Bond movie. There was, of course, financial or surveillance manipulation, good old drug market domination, and so on. So while Bond goes on his mission, he must face the assassin Francisco Scaramanga, the titular man with the golden gun. The action culminates in an old-school duel that settles the fate of the Solex, in one of my favorite Bond villain lairs, complete with a very diminutive murderous butler. I'm pretty sure Hugo Mountbatten has, has a guy like this, uh, <laughs> feeding him goats and bringing him champers. Sounds a bit old fashioned, doesn't it? Pistols at dawn, that sort of thing. Indeed it is, Mr. Bond, but it still remains the only true test for gentlemen. Christopher Lee is incredibly brilliant in this movie. His mesmeric balance of classy charm and terrifying, formidable menace is absolutely undeniable. This contract killer enjoys whacking his targets with a single bullet firing solid gold gun. So naturally, his gold signet ring and watch match. Unfortunately, the brand and model has never really been decided on by Bond fans. Some people think it's a Piaget due to the golden Milanese style bracelet, but I actually believe it to be a Rolex Cellini King Midas. Regardless, it's slim, elegant, dressy, and has a luxurious bit of pizzazz without being too blingy. Absolutely perfect. Now, here is where I'd like to make a few honorable mentions as dressy gold watches have been the most consistently worn of all types of watches by the classic Bond villains, especially ones we sadly cannot identify. There's the simple gold dress watch of the Herman Goring-like character Goldfinger himself, which could be any watch, to be honest, because uh, many watches of the 1960s simply looked like that. Then there are several gold watches worn by one of my favourite villains, Dr. Kananga in Live and Let Die, played so masterfully and charismatically by Yefet Koto. Or how about the Franz Sanchez in Licence to Kill, portrayed by Robert Davi? In some scenes, it looks like an Escobar-style Rolex Day Date, which of course would be absolutely fitting for his character. In other scenes, it's a completely different watch. So again, I can't really be sure. Finally, there's the highly oleaginous Kamal Khan in Octopussy. Again, very similar to the Rolex Midas, but we simply cannot be sure. I mean, gold is always a safe choice. It's synonymous with wealth and power and its history, its symbolism, its connotations. Uh, so I think it definitely fits the uh, megalomaniac, greedy, ruthless villain uh, perfectly. 
This man has a secret ambition. I propose to end the domination of Silicon Valley. At number two, it's Max Zorin in the 1985 movie A View to a Kill, played by the inimitable one and only Christopher Walken. With such great relish and panache, it's really quite hilarious and fun to watch him, but still with that very threatening, true romance, wise guy kind of capable sense of intimidation. <laughs> All with that slightly alien quality that only Walken can provide. While this super 80s schlockfest is often considered a low point for the franchise, mainly due to Roger Moore's advanced age, this was of course his last appearance as the fictional super spy. However, to me, it's important for several reasons when it comes to villainy and horology. The character Zorin is a product of Nazi scientific experimentation with genetics. A regime that, let's not forget, was completely obsessed with racial theory and pseudo-scientific eugenics to its very core. But aside from crackpot racist ideology, Nazism was a deeply overarching influence on the villainy of Fleming's writing. As we saw in the recent and rather disappointing Netflix film Operation Mincemeat, based on the real-life secret espionage operations of the British in World War II, Fleming is depicted and provides the narration. In stories of war, there is that which is seen and that which is hidden. In God's name, Fleming, what are you writing? Spy story. Fleming, after all, was involved in naval intelligence at the very highest levels. There are so many ways this inspired his work. From Churchill's special operations executives' use of gadgetry and assassination, sabotage and surveillance, even the origins of the villains' lairs themselves, it too was deeply rooted in the enemy headquarters during the war. For example, the Eagle's Nest, the Wolf's Lair, or the Ober Salzburg complex and so on. You see, SOE spent massive amounts of time studying them in intricate detail in order to find weaknesses so they could try and assassinate the Führer and his top brass. But fundamentally, let's look at the uh, appearance of a lot of these villains. You'll notice, most often than not, there'll be a scar on the face, and this is rooted in Fleming's old adversary. Uh, a lot of German officers and the German high command in World War II were made up of Prussian aristocrats who went to military school, and in those military schools they would fence and they'd, uh, you know, they'd get scars in their face and they'd wear it as a mark of pride, as a badge of honor almost. So this stereotype kind of leaked into, you know, the villainy of um, Fleming's world, often. Max Zorin is the poster child, quite literally, and personification of survival of the most fittest, evil and ruthless. Just looking at him, there's undeniably elements of Reinhard Heydrich in him. So what watch did this blonde Aryan looking megalomaniac wear? Well, again, we see an evil mirror image of Bond, a gold-plated version of the same Seiko 7A28-7020 chronograph 007 war in the infamous igloo cold open of the movie. While some may criticize this as obvious product placement, this is, after all, the peak of the Roger Moore and Seiko Bond watch era, it was the cutting edge tech of the day and entirely plausible that a tech billionaire yuppie like Zorin would have one. Oh, Commander Bond. Call me James. It's... Seiko wasn't seen in the same way it is these days. In the 80s, digital and quartz watches, especially in gold tone, were all the rage for trendy, ruthless, capitalistic go-getters. And let's be honest, they match his wickedly cool Cartier sunglasses too. For Bond, it was even more believable, as the watch in a later bead-blasted form would go on to become officially issued to RAF pilots due to its super accuracy, reliability and world-changing technology. You see, it made horological history as the world's first analog quartz chronograph. But not only that, it boasted a one-tenth of a second stopwatch and is the ancestor of today's humble flightmaster. So who's at my number one spot? Well. It's Le Chiffre from uh, the 2006 Casino Royale, played by my favourite Danish actor of all time, 
we are of course talking about the great, great, great Mads Mikkelsen. And you might spot him, he's in the poster there in Pusher 2, uh, one of my favorite uh, trilogy of uh, movies there. This was a refreshingly multi-layered villain. For the first time, we saw perhaps the most dynamic range of emotions. From genuine fear and terror, to vulnerability, to a tortured desperation, an inner bubbling rage, vengeful delight, and so on. Delivered in a way that only Mickelson can do, with such a masterfully nuanced and understated manner, but most importantly, completely believable. To the right! To the right! You are a funny man, Mr. Bond. Yeah! He plays a banker slash associate partner of Spectre, who services many of the world's criminals and terrorists. He is a mathematical genius and an expert chess player, using his skills effectively when playing poker. He goes up against Bond, this time Daniel Craig in his first outing as 007 in a super high stakes game, and despite his best efforts to beat Bond, he loses and thus ends up causing his own demise. In fact, his name, Chiffre, means or translates to numbers or figures in French. So what better than a watch that counts? And as one of the most dapper villains I've ever seen, they perfectly chose the Longines Evidencer chronograph. While the film's attention was certainly on Amiga, Longines, just like Hamilton, are under the Swatch Empire's umbrella. So we saw all these brands being worn. Remember Felix Leiter, played by Jeffrey Wright, sporting a khaki X-wing? Longines is not what it used to be, and you could say that about a lot of Swatch brands, but compared to Hamilton and Amiga, who are pushing ahead and still doing great, great new things, Longines is the furthest away from its uh, golden era, which was the late 19th and early 20th century, where they were industry leaders, um, producing pioneering uh, movements and watches. They were winning awards and yeah, they were the, riding the crest of, of the, uh, the Swiss wave, so to speak. In 1878, the company produced its first chronograph movement, the revered 20H caliber, and became world renowned for its precise timing. A heritage very fitting for a bad guy called Mr. Numbers. While long jeans have become more synonymous with shopping malls and generally less exciting kind of pedestrian designs today, the 20H Calibre helped the brand and launched it into the world of equestrian sports, something they are still involved in timing to this very day, which adds an inherent sense of class to the brand image. The Evidenza is unequivocally 1930s in aesthetic, with a tourneau-shaped case, typical of the time, Art Deco-styled Arabic numerals, and a harmoniously balanced V-shaped layout to the sub-dials. Talking a long jean, now time for some honourable mentions. In Skyfall, the assassin Patrice, played by Ola Rapace, wears another long jean, this time perhaps my favourite of all the modern reissues, the aptly named Legend Diver, which is based on their rich heritage of making 1960s compressor designs. Next is another of my favourites, that so nearly made it into my top five in fact, because if you've watched the channel you know I'm a huge Navi Timer fanboy, and I actually did end up owning this watch for a little while. So there's no way I could make this video without mentioning the Breitling Navitimer 806 that Paul Stasino, playing Francois Duval, wears in Thunderball. Taken off a dead aircraft captain's body, he then wears it as part of his disguise while imitating him in order to infiltrate the RAF. This was really cool for me to see the watch being used so effectively and convincingly, because also the choice is very period correct. Then there's the Hoyer Airline GMT, worn by General Pushkin, played by the great John Rhys Davies in Timothy Dalton's debut, The Living Daylights. This ultra 80s looking GMT is mostly forgotten about these days, but I think it was really fitting for the era and came with a Q-branch style panic button that alerted one's guards or henchmen when required. I really must get some henchmen like that. I mean, what, is there some 1-800 number you dial, like 1-800 henchmen or something? I've always wondered that. Have, have you guys wondered that? It was nice to see bad guys could also have gadgetry in a watch. Churchill's Secret Army style. And let's not forget, Bond also wears a Hoya in this movie. So definitely product placement. Last, but by no means least, there is of course the wonderfully named Pussy Galore from Goldfinger, played by Honor Blackman. Yeah. 
another GMT, but this time the ultimate GMT of all time. The Pepsi GMT Master 6542 no less. What better watch could an aircraft acrobatic pilot wear? So that is my top five, along with many honorable mentions. I'm sure I've left out a whole bunch. So do share your nominations down in the comments below. But most importantly, observations, opinions, um, any special meaning or significance behind the, the villain's choice of watch. Yeah, do share that in the comments. I love hearing your feedback. Uh, don't forget to like this video, very important indeed if you want to see more free and independent content like this. It's the best way to support the channel. Oh, and if you missed it, check out this video. This is not your typical Arnie, <laughs> Seiko Arnie review. Even if you're not into Seiko, you've got to check out this video. There were so many things uh, that I kind of discovered and wanted to share with you. One of my favorite videos I've made this year. So yeah, if you missed it, check it out. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. I will catch you in the next one. Onwards and upwards. Ciao.